Richard, I know you want to start dancing. Oh my gosh, we finally are live. Thank you for standing by. If you're watching on YouTube, this is Kitchen Party. Please subscribe to our channel so every week when we do another show, you are the first to know. If you're watching on Google+, Plus, hello guys. Welcome to our event page. We're here every Thursday, another Kitchen Party, Eastern, 8 p.m., 5 p.m. Pacific. And today I'm, I'm really sad because we don't, have, we don't have Jeff. We don't have Jeff with us today. Hmm. Renee is in traffic, in L.A. traffic, so we're going we're gonna to be <laughs> sending a cheers to Renee. This is how Renee gets cheers. here. Jeff. Jeff if, Jeff, you're, if you're watching, sorry about your computer. we're thinking about you. Um, to everyone else who's watching on Twitter, use the hashtag Kitchen Party. Um, today's topic is Southern cooking and all the amazing stuff that goes with that. And our guest today is Ted Lee, who is part of the Lee Brothers duo. I don't know if you guys are very familiar with them. They are fantastic. It's an amazing story. And they have a new cookbook out. So um, do you want to really quickly, uh, Ted, give us just a quick introduction to sort of where you're calling in from and what you're drinking, and then we'll progress from there. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be delighted to. I'm so happy to be here with you. Um, so I'm Ted Lee. I'm the younger Lee brother, um, and I'm calling in to you from St. Louis, Missouri, um, where I've been eating a lot of pie. Um, I happen to be drinking um, a nice bourbon, though, that someone just put in my hand. Um, I'm very grateful. I'm not sure quite the provenance, and I guess I'm not enough of a bourbon snob to know exactly what it is. I should be able to say, like, oh, yes, this is the Pappy Van Winkle 15-year. Oh, no, it's the Special Reserve Old Weller. Um, <laughs> but it's tasting really good, and I'm really glad to be here. That's fantastic. I was going to ask you if you ever put your um, your alcohol on ice, like on the rocks, or do you do you? Because I usually do scotch oh, on the yeah. rocks. Yeah, I'll do, I'll put a nice Cuban bourbon if I'm feeling it. Um, I have to say I'm in the, uh, this uh, producer's office in St. Louis, and it's kind of freezing cold in here. So <laughs> this bourbon is like my warm fireplace in the middle of summer. You know. You know, we I, I'm in L.A., and we've had the coldest summer I've ever seen in my entire really? life. I, I don't know. Last night, we were, we were walking the dog, and we're like, why do we need a jacket? <laughs> it's like July. We don't understand. That so, is unheard of. Yeah, no. So have you been to L.A.? I have been to L.A. I have been to L.A. In fact, my wife and I went there on our honeymoon because um, she really has this L.A. Um, – she gets so much inspiration. She's a sculptor, and she gets so much inspiration from Los Angeles and car culture and all kinds of culture out there. Um, so we went there for our honeymoon, and we just had a blast. That's very I could, cool. I, could, I, I, I mean, I could live there in a minute. <laughs> really? You know, yeah. I, I, I'm always amazed when people move to L.A. I mean, I moved here yeah. when I was eight from Michigan, but I just they, there's it's such a um, it's such a town for hopes and dreams and mm -hmm, everyone has mm -hmm. another story like nobody has like one job people have yeah. you know they're this yeah. by day but by night they're writing their screenplay yeah. or they're doing something um, do you find that that happens in other places like such so concentrated like it is here no I mean I think LA is unique in the sense and this is why my my wife is drawn to it because she you know she grew up on the East Coast where everyone you know it's like you have to have this history and you went to what school and you did this and it's like <laughs> she could just go to LA and completely create a new a new Evie um, and it was it was amazing we go back there a lot um, well now I, when you come I, back I was gonna say now when you come back you've got to let Renee and I know because we'll, we'll take you I on a food will. crawl I would Whatever love it is to you do want to eat. I've, I've done a few food crawls, and they've all been awesome, um, and I'd love <laughs> to go back. There's so much that... Um, oh, there's Renee. Yeah, I was going to hey. say, speaking of... Renee, we just mentioned a food crawl. <laughs> I was going to mention donuts, but I figured, you know, we had we need to keep the place a little classy. <laughs> Guys, I am so sorry I'm late. I am I'm so sorry to you, Babette, and to our guests. Yeah, it's okay. Good it's all good. It's all good. Hey, look, we saved the best for last. Of course, Jeff's not here, but we're we, we're we're thinking of the second best for last. We haven't even we haven't even started talking about southern food. We're just talking about LA right now. 
Exactly, awesome. exactly. So you know, I'm 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 going to control the chat, the chatter mm -hmm. that's happening on Twitter, and I'm going to, for those of you who are watching online on YouTube, leave a comment on our event page on Google Plus, and then also on Twitter. If you use the hashtag Kitchen Party, it makes it really easy for me to find your questions. Um, so I guess let's just you know, when you said your brother, are you guys twins? Because when you said no. I'm the older, yeah, I'm I'm the older, taller, wiser. Um, no, I'm the. I'm sorry. I'm the younger. Advisor. That's that's a complicated part. It's like my brother's like, yeah, you have less hair. You look older, and I'm like, no, but I'm younger, and I look. I have this gravitas about me. It's like wiser. Um, it's great when he's not around. When he can't refute anything I say. Um, yeah, no, we're not twins. We're not twins. We're just uh, conventional brothers. He's two years older than I am. Um, and it's funny, you know, Babette, you were saying you moved to Los Angeles when you were eight, which was exactly the age that um, I moved to Charleston. Because, um, hmm. you know, another thing that's sort of, a, 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 you know, the sub-story of everything um, Matt and I write about the South is that we weren't born in the South, which kind of means a lot in the South. Um, I really think that kernel is really the core of why we're food writers, because we moved to the South um, at a time when, you know, I, we moved from New York City, which is where my, my mother is from um, Manhattan. My father's from a farming community um, up in Westchester, or it was a farming community 50 years ago, but now it's like condos and whatnot. But anyhow... Long story short, they moved to the South, and, and, and for Matt and me, like, there was so much that was going on um, among our peers at age eight and nine that was, like, completely related to food. Like, they already knew how to throw a cast net and catch shrimp, and they already knew how to, like, tie a drop line, like, tie a string around a chicken neck and throw it in the water and reel in, you know, blue crabs, and to us... I mean, you know, kids who lived in New York, remember, I was, you know, this was in the 70s. We moved to Charleston in 79. In the 70s in, in New York City, if you were a kid, you were terrified of <laughs> everything. Um, and you never left your apartment because you might get snatched off the street. And so the fact that we could, you know, in downtown Charleston, go down to the pilot boat dock and, like, throw a cast net, it was just so exotic. I'm wondering if you encountered anything in L.A. that would, like, it, you know, you said you moved to Michi L.A. from Michigan. Was there anything that was, oh, like, man. cultural? I mean. Uh, you know, I'm, tr I'm trying to think that, you know, the food. I have a really bland palate, and this has been something that I, I have, like, a very Midwest mm -hmm. type of food I like. And it's not that I, I don't know what it is. And I'm not saying a Midwest food is bland, but in comparison to, like, the L.A. kind of, Foofy, shishy, right. whatever. I really like the good stuff that just makes you have like great memories and makes you feel right. warm. Right. You know, that's gonna take yeah. me, it's gonna hold me. Um, so I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I feel like I had such a strong like when people ask me, they're like, "Are you from LA?" And I'm like, "Well, actually, I moved here when I was eight. I feel like I'm a local because I feel like this has been almost my right. own home. But I think being from somewhere else gives you a really strong foundation. It's like it's." different. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's very different. It's like I feel like I didn't grow up, you yeah. know, I, I don't know. Just I felt a little bit more rooted in, in reality a bit. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> well, it, it, and it's funny because, it, I mean, in L.A. it's probably different, but in Charleston specifically, like, if you weren't born there, forget if you weren't born there, you might even be born there, but if your, like, grandparents weren't born there, you know, it, it's, it's kind of funny. I think it's changed a lot. Charleston is changing so much every day um, in, in many exciting ways. Um, but it is like, it, you know, it, it, it's something it, it's something that I think gives me perspective on it. I mean, that was the, the crazy thing when I was a kid, like moving to Charleston, is that everyone was like, what do you mean you don't know how to throw a cast net and catch <laughs> shrimp? Like, this is just what we do. Whereas, like, to me, it was really special and something that was very exotic, and my parents didn't have um, a cast net, <laughs> you know, they didn't know how to boil peanuts, and so to me it was like I had to learn, I had to learn so much, and that's why I think, 
in general, Matt and I always like focus on what we're sort of continually continually discovering mm -hmm. about Southern food, whether it's Charleston. I mean, you know, we we our most recent book is the Lee Brothers Charleston Kitchen, and it's our third book. And in a way, we kind of went circuit it like. This is kind of the book I kind of wanted to write the first time, but our editor said, you can't just write a Charleston book. You know, the first book we turned in was like, it was 125 recipes, and it was mostly Charleston, and she was like, no, nah, you have to make, you have to blow this out, and it took like six years to write, and, and, and in this book, we really get to go back to the place we know best, um, which was awesome, but at the same time, we wanted to discover new things about the place we knew well, and so we sort of had to push ourselves into, um, you know, you know, instead of just sort of connecting with our crab guy in the way we usually did, which was at the dock. Like, um, I call him up, he says, I'll be at the dock at four, I meet him at the dock, I pick up the crabs, you know. This time, you know, we had the luxury in researching this book to say, um, you know what, Fred, we want to go on the boat with you for a day, and we want to see what your day is like. Um, and when you do that, you learn so much about the ingredient that you never even considered, just because there's there's so much to think about. And, there's, and you also see the amount of work that goes into harvesting a bushel of crabs, and you're like, oh, my God. I mean, the Lee brothers lasted, like, um, we, we had said we were going to go out for the day, Fred, our crab guy, and we lasted like two or three hours because it was, <laughs> it was like February. Um, <laughs> it was like 42 degrees on the water. And, I mean, I had like my hat pulled down. Like I had some, like some Michigan, Wisconsin kind of headgear. I had a big down parka. But it's still it's freezing cold. And, he, you know, to him it's just like he's on the water for 14 hours a day. And that's that's his bliss. It's cool. That sounds awesome. And, you know, before we move on, I wanted to, uh, Renee, you're from New Jersey originally, but did you move to L.A. at a certain time as as a child? Uh, no, I moved to L.A. as an adult. Um, uh, but as you were, you were talking, I I remember being, I, I lived grew up in New Jersey, but we were we had a view. You could see Manhattan not too far. From, not that my house had a view of Manhattan, but you could see Manhattan. That's how close we were. And I remember what it was like in the 1970s, I mean, with Elon Potts and David Berkowitz, I mean, people were right. terrified as a child to be outside. And then for, in our, our summers and vacations, my mom, who was a farmer, who grew up as a farmer in North mm -hmm. Carolina, we would go down there for the summers. Mm -hmm. And as you're saying this, I can envision all that. We were, you know, as soon as you got there, the shoes came off and you were just running right. through cornfields. And it's such a completely completely different experience. Yeah. I, I, maybe this question was asked and I missed it, but what led you to Charleston versus another southern city? What led my parents to Charleston? Mm -hmm. it, um, my, 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 you know, my parents were raising three children in a really small apartment. You know, my father was, um, my father's a professor of medicine and my mom's um, a, a, a school teacher. I, I mean, she's a school administrator and they were just raising three children uh, and on the Upper West Side in a tiny apartment, and they were just, I mean, my sister was four at the time. I was eight. I think Matt was ten. Um, and they just had to get out. You know, it was like, like, like that classic thing, and they actually, had, my mom had a friend from high school who had, um, who had moved to Charleston, and so we'd been visiting for several summers, I guess, and and they went into the city of Charleston. I mean, like a lot of people do, they just fall in love with it, and they fell in love with it, and they connected with some parents who were, who were, um, you know, they they met some Charlestonians, and they were just like, you know what, we we just need to we need a change, and it, it was a it was a huge change. I mean, certainly for them, probably more than it was for me, because they sort of had to adapt to sort. Of, I, I just, you know, to me, it was like. Oh wow! You know how to catch shrimp? Cool. Like, teach me that. Um, I mean, there were some cultural things that were hard to process as an eight-year-old, but I think for me, like, that's sort of why I sort of, you know, latched onto food. Um, is that 
um, my grandmother was always a great cook, and I loved her. I, I loved I loved food, um, and I loved you know trying new things. My grandmother, um, when she was a child, she um, she's a, a, a native New Yorker, like twelfth generation Manhattanite, um, who later moved to Charleston and became like Miss Charleston. She was kind of like a, a celebrity in Charleston, but she she had grown up in Japan. Um, and in the 20s and so she had a lot like when I was really young I, I would go to her house to her apartment because it was near my mom's school and then my mom would pick me up and she had like nori you know like seaweed paper and you know if you if you have nori when you're five-year-old or six-year-old like it kind of changes your perspective it's just like what is this salty deliciousness that kind of tastes like the smell of fish food? You know, it, it, it's just, I don't know. I was always oriented toward um, experimenting, you know, it's sort of like trying new things. You know, you I, and I, I was, were completely the opposite. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I'd be like, uh, no, 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 we're not going to try that. <laughs> hey, I just want to put a shout out. Um, a couple things. One is, Renee, I'm using Firefox. I'm not using Chrome tonight. So Ooh, okay. I can't see any of our icons in the chat room that we're, or in the room that we're talking. I can I can see our, our big screen, but just so you know, if you want to chime in, okay. just don't look for a cue for me visually because I can't see you. Okay. But <laughs> you guys sound amazing. <laughs> um, that's, that's how good we are. We roll with the punches, people. Exactly. But I want, I want I wanted to put a shout out on Twitter because we got some folks, uh, we got some folks drinking, we got some folks hanging out. We got Good. Dance for Foodies on Twitter. Uh, first of all, started off the conversation tonight with saying, "What is everyone drinking?" So I want to, I want to let our people know we appreciate your enthusiasm. <laughs> and um, let's see, Mama Caruso one on Twitter said, "Pineapple basil mojitos in mason jars." Now, Ted, we have this thing oh, where we yeah. drink in these ridiculous <laughs> jars. <laughs> the uglier. I'm the better. <laughs> really? Yeah. So I've got this very corporate, like... Oh, no, no, no. Go yeah, get the mason jar, buddy. <laughs> we tried to class this up a bit. We appreciate that. Um, Dinner Mariah is also tuning in. Just wanted to give a shout-out to tell everyone to check out Kitchen Party. Super cool that you're here. Uh, Mama Caruso also said, I was in Nashville recently and had killer cheesy grits. Would love some southern tips for replicating. Oh, Ooh, Yeah. Cool. Cheesy grits. You definitely want to go to. Um, well, you want to buy my first book. Um, no, <laughs> there's a really great baked cheese grits with bacon, but you can leave out the bacon if you want. Um, in my first book, and I'm sure you can find it online because that recipe was published in a lot of places. Um, can you tell us what the name of the book was? Oh yeah, th the first book, um, the Lee Brothers Southern Cookbook. The Lee Brothers Southern Cookbook. Um, and I, can, that was, I can interject and say it's a wonderful cookbook and people should go buy it. <laughs> thank you, Renee. Thank you, Renee. But you can get the recipe online. I know you can. I think um, at cookster.com I'm pretty sure they have it because it was one of the it was one of the recipes. You know, it was funny because each book we've done is so different visually and physically. Um, and that book, you know, it had 600 pages, 225 recipes, but it, it only had like 32 photos. And that really bugs people. But one of the photos was of that cheesy grits with bacon, and it's a baked, you know, cheese grits with bacon. And uh, that that became one that was reproduced many times. Um, but yeah, Nashville is a great food town. Have either of you been to Nashville? I have not. Mm -mm. It's funny because in Charleston, there's been this sort of controversy. It's like um, they're worried that Nashville's like taking over the the sort of noise that Charleston's been creating, but I think what's great about Southern cooking is that each each Southern city ha really has its own character and its own identity, um, and that's something that I think gets lost. You know, it's like, um, you know, Nashville, Birmingham, Memphis, Atlanta, like each one of those cities is so different and it has its own traditions and you know it can be sort of a challenge to figure out like well what is different about Nashville versus Atlanta versus Memphis but if, if you spend enough time there and you and you tune into the sort of food geeks that are really um, engaged in sort of the discussion of southern food it, it can be really fun I, I wonder where those cheesy grits in Nashville came from <laughs> they yeah, sound delicious 
Maybe oh, she can tweet us the rest. Tweet us the address. Or yeah, rather, tweet us the, the restaurant, restaurant. The name of the restaurant. Maybe it was, you know, um, uh, there's a chef in Sean in uh, Charleston named Sean Brock, and he just opened a place in Nashville. Um, but I don't think he does cheese grits. He usually does more um, sort of field peas and and more sort of heirloom vegetable type stuff. Anyhow, Nashville, great town. I, th I think Renee and I, we have to go make a, a run there. <laughs> Renee and I are basing all of our, tra all of our tra travel over our food. <laughs> you should do a kitchen party road trip. Yes, we want to do that. Hey, we should, Renee, we should do a Kickstarter campaign for that. That's See if right. people will, will get do us to their town. Um, send, send Renee fun. to Charleston. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, it, also, oh, go ahead. What were you going to say, Ted? Oh, I was going to say it, it's, it's kind of getting really fun just sort of in the southern food community at large because um, uh, the the Southern Foodways Alliance, which is an organization that's all about studying the diverse cultures of the American South, is putting together itineraries and apps and things and films that are all about these different pockets of culture around the South that show you just how how differently people eat from place to place around the South. And it's, you know, it, it, it's really fun. It really feels like a very an exciting community and it's it really is about um, educating people and sharing and you know it, it's just it, it's kind of awesome I absolutely agree I think that's where I discovered the Waffle House <laughs> yeah <laughs> so, like like of course I'm letting all my people down like you think I'm gonna say like some high-tech place or whatever I'm like Waffle House no I mean I, <laughs> the other thing I think that's fun about dining in the south now is that 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 we we really can have it all I mean you you know I think what's interesting is that you know Matt and I our new book the Lee Brothers Charleston Kitchen the one that someone's gonna win um, in this hour is is really about home cooking which you know all the all the noise out of Charleston in the last five years has all, all been about the restaurants but the restaurant culture in Charleston is very young I mean it's like you know 20 years ago like not a lot of this stuff existed um, and it, it, it's mostly a home cooking town it was a town that um, generated a lot of great early cookbooks um, like Sarah Rutledge's Carolina Housewife and 200 Years of Charleston Cooking. Sarah Rutledge was in 1847. Um, 200 Years of Charleston Cooking was in the 1930s and then Charleston Receipts. But it has this sort of very home cooking kind of angle. Um, and that's, you know, that's also interesting to, to think about, you know, when you go to a southern city is like, you know, is the restaurant experience sort of reflective of the home cook? cooking experience or is it a completely new thing um, to me it's exciting to to explore both those angles like for us like Charleston home cooking I think the easiest place for someone visiting Charleston to experience like Charleston home cooking if they don't know someone who invited them into their home is to go to the spring in the spring the, all the church parish halls open these tea rooms that really aren't tea rooms, they're just like a lunch place and the parishioners cook, it's like a fundraiser for the church and the parishioners cook um, dishes that are classic Charleston dishes like she crab soup, Huguenot tort, Charleston okra soup, um, they'll usually make pimento cheese sandwiches or shrimp and grits and it's a really great way to experience um, you know, sort of like old school Southern cooking that's, you know, can be, that's very different from a lot of the things that hap that are happening in restaurants, which are sort of, you know, Charleston, the number one industry is tourism. It's mostly like a lot of the restaurants aren't accessible to a lot of people who travel there because the entrees start at like, you know, $32. And so, you know, it's, there's this interesting sort of interplay between what's happening at the high end of food and what's the vernacular um, classics. Um, and I think more and more people are coming to an understanding that you don't have to choose one or the other. It's like it's like what mood are you in, you know? 
Um, How did you decide with your with your new book to focus in on home cooking as opposed to kind of tapping into that relatively new restaurant scene? Because I think that I think that the way Matt and I grew up was more in the home cooking end of it. Um, you know, we grew up in the '80s in Charleston, and it was it was a very transitional time, and it was like in the eighties like the restaurants in Charleston were either French, Italian, or there were one or two that were serving sort of like local food, but it what they it was really like you went out, out to eat to get something else. And to us, like having moved from New York, what was exotic to us was like local food, you know, like actually going to, you know, a place like the wreck and having fried fish and grits. And it's like wait, fish and grits? Wait, what? You know, like, just trying to piece it all together. Um, and we really felt like there are a lot of stories um, in Charleston that were untold that are about these sort of people who are heroes of the food world in Charleston from a home cook's perspective. They might also be heroes to restaurant chefs as well, but whose stories aren't necessarily told. You know, like the guy who, my crab guy, Fred Dockery, like, you know, I don't, I don't know that many people who know him, but he's like a hero um, to so many. He, he supplies the, the really serious independent fish markets with their blue crab, their stone crab claws, and their conch, um, which is a, a small but sort of important market in the Charleston area because you know people cook with it, and um, and just it to be able like to a band conch. Conk. Conk. I'm watch conch. Conch tonight. Conk. <laughs> I, don't, no, conch. I don't mean to digress, but try to keep it. In the have, theme you ever, of have, have you ever cooked with conk? I don't even know what that is. Is is that a crab? Um, it's like a sna it's a sea snail. It's like a big conk. I can no, assure you, I have never cooked with any snail like <laughs> anything. <laughs> like, I told you, I'm I am a muted eater. I like. Okay. White. That's White totally stuff. cool. I, I, I had never, punk fritters. Yes, exactly. That's what's in our book. And um, you know, it's funny because Matt and I had never cooked with conch either. Um, and uh, not before we went out on Fred Dockery's boat, but he said there was this um, that there is a small market for conch. Um, mostly, he said he he um, mostly he said in. in um, fish markets that cater to African Americans in Charleston and we we were we we took it back and we were thinking in a different direction like you know you see the sea snail and you think oh like um, some sort of ceviche like shave it really thin lemon juice and whatever we tried so many things and we could not make it delicious and so we asked Fred well where do you sell this because we want to like you know and he pointed us to a fish market that we had bought oysters from, but we just hadn't thought of for, we get oysters there for our oyster roast, but we just, it's a little bit far out of town. So we went there, and, um, and that sort of introduced us to a whole, new, this fish market, um, amazing, it's called Backman Seafood, um, and the, the proprietor, uh, there's several, but they're, brothers and sisters, but Mr. Backman said, we said, what do we do with conch? And he said, um, you, you chop it up so that no piece is larger than a grain of rice. And you grate one onion, an egg, and I mean, he's just, just like telling us this recipe. And we, we went home and it was like taking notes, you know, and we did it, and it was brilliant. It's totally addictive. Um, it's like he said it was going to be like eating potato chips, like your hand moves and you're, you don't even – and it's exactly that. Conch fritters are amazing, um, and there's something that I hadn't had in Charleston, although they are common um, uh, until I was in my 30s. I'm going to bring Renee to Charleston because I'm going to get her some of that conch. <laughs> That's my it's, job. <laughs> you know, it's, it, we, were, we tried so many things with that conch, and we couldn't make it delicious until we went to Mr. Backman. Then, you know, they're interesting. Like, Mr. Backman is his own story. He, um, 
he's the second generation, um, and he runs this fish market that's sort of like a secret in Charleston. It's I can only compare it to um, the markets I saw when I was in um, Japan, where everything is so beautifully laid out, and it's in really you know they know their market, they know what they buy, they and they only serve things that like come straight out the creek. So everything is so fresh, and you can get it scaled for you, you can get it gutted, and um, and it's just amazing. And and we started spending more time in that market and realized that his mother started the business um, and she her name was Susie Backman and she was running three fishing boats out of this tiny dock just south of Charleston near Folly Beach um, in the 60s she was running three trawlers um, and like netting like three thousand dollars a month in 1960s dollars like she was a really wealthy powerful woman in the food community in in Charleston and um, we were we were sort of inquiring more about her and he said oh yeah um, there was there was an article about her in Ebony magazine um, back in the 60s and and so we actually found a copy of that Ebony online and it has this huge 12 page spread article called Queen of the Shrimpers and it has these amazing pictures of her mending her nets and she was apparently just this really fierce awesome powerful woman in the in the food community and and um, and it's just you know that's that's one of those stories that you sort of never hear but there are so many people today who appreciate Backman seafood and and their you know the attention to freshness and the awesomeness of it and you know that's part of the story of Charleston that needs to be told so I think that's why Matt and I wanted to focus on it from a home cooks perspective mostly because we are not restaurant cooks we have no we I mean I can tell you some chefs who can tell you who can vouch for me when I say that we do not know our way around a restaurant kitchen because <laughs> um, you know we do a lot of collaborative events with restaurant chefs and they're like yeah come on like um, we'll do a whole menu from your book, and we're like, um, you probably don't want us, and, and they're like, we can do it all for you, or you can come in and cook with us, and you're like, we don't know any of that equipment, like, we don't know what a <laughs> tilt skillet is, we don't know what a hotel pan, like, people are like, get me the hotel pan, and you're like, what is that? You know, that reminds me of in television. You would mess up like the people who were lower level. Like you would ask them for like something ridiculous. You know, there's like a whole bunch of commercials like that. But you would always try to get the PAs to like lose their mind all day long, and you'll be like, no, 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 I just wanted a cup of coffee. Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah, there's like there's like a whole lingo of the back of the house in a kitchen. I'm totally terrified of it. And you know, even chefs who are so friendly, and they're like, oh, come on, you know, come on in my kitchen. Cook on the line. I've I've never cooked on the line, so I don't know. I, I don't know the first thing about that. I, I can develop a recipe for, you know, two, four, six, eight, twelve, whatever <laughs> you want. But as soon as the funniest thing happened once when we were on tour with the first book, we went to Zingerman's in in um, Michigan, right? Ann Arbor. I think we that's a have, famous place. Too. Yeah, we went. I think, to I think my boyfriend actually tried to get us to go there. He's like, "We got to go there," and he's asking everyone on the plane. And I'm like, "What?" <laughs> ended up not making the drive, but it seemed interesting. <laughs> we went to Zingerman's Roadhouse, and the chef there, Alex, is so brilliant. He was like, "We're gonna rip a, like eight course menu, um, and they sell out every event they do." So we were just like, "We we trust you, man." And we he said, "So I'm gonna do boiled peanut soup." That was like, you know, boiled peanuts or something that are very close to our hearts. It's a snack food in Charleston. But we were, in our first book, we did some kind of things that were punk rock. And one of them was this boiled peanut soup. And we were like, yeah, yeah, that's cool. And we forgot that, like, he was, he was taking a recipe for four that involved shelling a half cup of boiled peanuts, which is actually a pretty arduous process. And he was scaling it up to, like, 120. So... Oh my God! We were in his kitchen for like six hours shelling peanuts, which is not—you know—it's sort of like bearding muscles. It's not something that anyone would ever want to do. 
Anyhow, Renee, tales from the road. I'm boring you. No, no, no. We love this. Hey, I want I want to put a shout out. Speaking of like back a house, because I kind of look at our Google Plus fans as being like a part of our community, a part of our show. Without them, we are nothing. Um, I want to make sure a shout out goes to Joy Harris. Joy Harris is on and she said, looking forward to learning more about Southern cooking, so welcome. Uh, we have Ninja Baker, Kim Whitkinson, said, I'm enchanted by Charleston and its cobblestone streets. I also yes. admire the rich tradition of Southern cooking. Looking forward to a great kitchen party. And then Kim Pebley checked in, also was like, what's up? And then Mariah Milano says, I cooked with Jeff a monster dinner last night. He's probably trying to catch up. That's why he's not in. <laughs> now we know the truth, Jeff. And then now Kim, we know the truth. Kim Pebbly goes, no crow nuts. Um, Keys Cupcakes is also tuned in. And then Kim Pebbly um, said, a road trip, a Kickstarter campaign is a must. And then Ninja Baker has a question. She says, would Ted kindly share the name of the Southern Association again? The one that yes. talks about the food yeah. history. This is, this is something I think for anyone who's interested in Southern food um, and especially interested in knowing more about the different regions because it's, it's focus is on like the diversity of cultures that have come together to create what is now the South. Um, it's called the Southern Foodways Alliance. And I'm pretty sure it's southernfoodways.org. It might be southernfoodways.com. But you can go there and they have like 30 or 40 documentaries that you can screen for free. I'm pretty sure they have like whole barbecue itineraries that you can take. And it's really a great way into the... The other thing they do um, that's really amazing, it's part of... It's sort of an adjunct to the University of Mississippi in Oxford, um, the Center for Southern Studies there. And um, they have a symposium every October, which is like the summit of all the Southern food geeks. Um, but it's also, it's not just geeks, it's like, it's academics, it's writers, it's farmers, it's anthropologists, sociologists, it's chefs, um, producers, and it's, it's kind of like the Davos for Southern food. Um, and they have a ton, they do a ton of events, and they're, it's a nonprofit. Um, I feel very strongly about it because I feel like they they were the first ones who kind of like got us. Like, um, I remember when Matt and I we created this sort of fledgling business selling boiled peanuts by mail order in the early '90s, and um, it was sort of it was a very it's a very it, it remains a very niche business, but I. I got called by the Southern Foodways Alliance and I guess it was 2000 it was around the time they start they founded the organization and said we want you to come to Oxford to our symposium and give a lecture on the social history of the boiled peanut and I was like <laughs> wait is this a joke you're you're one of you're one of my mom's friends like educator <laughs> friends and you're like punking me, right? And they're like, no, no, really, we, we, we know who you are. And it was, it was kind of like, oh, now I've found my people. Um, and and it, is, cool. it is fun because, you know, people, I think people lose sight in, in, in you know, the, the south of, um, you know, the, the south that's presented on television is so, is so sort of, you know, it's so homogenized, and we forget that you know, there, there, there's a big Lebanese community that moved to West Virginia in the 30s to work the coal mines, and they have their own stories. And you know, that's something I learned at the Southern Food. up what you know what we know of as the South. Well there, there can be very much a, a view from outsiders that the South is like this one kind of mm -hmm. like voting block opinion. I have to ask you um, uh, if, if you wouldn't mind maybe talking a little bit about the Paula Dean issue. That really rattled. Um, oh, rattled. I was gonna yeah. mention. I was gonna. I was thinking. I was like, who's gonna be the first to bring it oh up? Oh my gosh. <laughs> well, you know, I, I I should sort of issue a disclaimer in the sense that. Um, Paula Dean has only been generous to the Lee brothers. She has given us blurbs for her book. I've been on her show twice. Um, but I have to say, I, you know, I, I had the impression, I was on a show called Paula's Party, um, and 
what I loved about the show that I was on and the, the ones that I watched is it seemed like everyone was invited to the party. Um, but I think that, you know, um, I think that that, sh that, th that we, you know, Paula Dean is sort of, who is Paula Dean? I don't think we really know because she's in an entertainment industrial complex. Um, and that wants to sort of push her into a place. I, I just don't know what the real voice is. I will say that the voice that came out in the deposition and I think in the responses is just, you know, it's, it just doesn't represent the South that I know. And I know to a lot of Southern chefs um, in, you know, among my colleagues, you know, that's really not Southern food. You know, it, it, it's, it's an interpretation of Southern food. Um, but it's not the one that I'm interested in. Um, I'm interested in a Southern food that gives context to what's happening today by giving credit to the people who brought us to where we are today. Um, and I know that, um, especially in the, the, the more recent um, discussions about this, this chef who's worked for her and feels that she hasn't been credit, credited, that is, that is throughout the South. And I'll tell you a story from our most recent book. We did a cheesecake recipe um, in the Lee Brothers Charleston Kitchen that's based on the only, what we think is the only recipe in Charleston receipts, which is like the Bible of Charleston cooking. It's the 20th century Bible of, of, of Charleston cooking. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's it's like a classic. Um, it's sold millions of copies, but it's a very mid-century book. And you have to remember, in mid-century in Charleston, you know, a lot of people had cooks, but the person who was credited in the recipe was the woman who was head of household. Mm. So we focused in on this cheesecake recipe because it was a brilliant recipe where the eggs are separated from the whites, and the whites get whipped separately and then folded in so it's intensely light and it wasn't cloyingly sweet, it was contributed by um, a woman who we knew who was the mother of um, our parents' lawyer, um, Lenny Krawcheck, and um, it was the only recipe in that book that was contributed by a member of the Jewish community, which was also interesting to us um, because Charleston has a, a big and 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 you know, storied Jewish community going back to the 1600s. And we called up Lenny and said, do you remember this, this, this recipe being served? Because we think it's really brilliant. We want to do our own adaptation of it in our own book. And we just want to know whether you remember this. Because there are a lot of people who have, who contributed recipes to that book, Charleston Receipts, and you ask their their grand, you know, every recipe was credited, so you can really like trace the lineage, and you can say, Winslow, did your grandmother make? Do you remember this pie your grandmother made? And he was like, No, she probably just got that from a magazine. Well, this is one where I could say, Lenny, do you remember your mother cooking this? And she said, Oh, yes, you. Ha this cheesecake was legendary. This in our family, it was fantastic. Um. But, and so we were said, okay, we want to run our adaptation. It's going to be called Agnes, it's going to be called, um, I can't remember what his mother's name, first name was, but, you know, Mrs. Krawcheck's Cheesecake. And he said, you know, you really, you really have to give credit where credit is due. That recipe was our cook's recipe, and her name was Agnes Jenkins. And, you know, Part of, part of like coming to terms with Southern culinary history is giving credit where credit is due. And I think it's so simple to do that. And it's simple to find, and it's, it's kind of like we're getting to the point where the oral histories, you know, we have to get them now. And that's why like I think the work of the Southern Foodways Alliance is so urgent, is because we have to do that now um, because we need to, we need to establish the links and and give credit where credit is due. Absolutely. So, you know, that was I, a long way no, around. No, no. Uh, we have a great, great I'm question. so glad. I mean, you know, we 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 don't need to argue the 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 allegations or whatever. That's been like beaten to death. I I was so much more interested in in kind of a cultural look. Thank you very much for that answer.
Absolutely. Um, Joy Harris on Google Plus wants to know, what's Ted's favorite home-cooked meal? Oh, my gosh. We're going to throw, throw you a hard one. Okay. <laughs> you know <laughs> the crazy. answer. It's, it's, <laughs> I know the answer. Um, so my favorite home-cooked meal, with if my wife is cooking, is homemade pasta, which she taught me to make, with um, my mother-in-law's bolognese sauce. Um, but that's, you know, that's her. My favorite, like... The way I entertain is very casual and very simple. And um, I like doing things like a big pork shoulder that people can share. Um, and that's sort of fun to, you know, that sort of has a presence. I like food that has a presence. I mean, it, you know, it doesn't have to be meat. Um, Lord knows. I mean, um, some of the most fun uh, meals I've had are when there's some sort of structure like, Someone says, oh, I don't eat meat. And so I have to, you know, I'm, I'm called upon to deliver the southern meal that has no meat in it. And that's a real Ted, thrill. Ted, going to show up on your doorstep. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a vegetarian. I'm a vegetarian. You are. But, oh, we do, but, we but do that's a real a... thrill. Um, and, and, and I think that, you know, the, the, the sort of quiet secret is that everything grows in the south, and we love our vegetables in the south. And the brawnier you know, the whole hog barbecue and the, the um, fried chicken, you know, that, that seems to occupy people's um, imagination more, but um, the vegetables are really no slouch. And I always say, I always say that I'll never open a restaurant because I don't have that talent. I can't work that hard. But if I did, it would be a, a, a vegetable restaurant, all served family style. Wow. I like that. We have, we have a couple of questions. One is from uh, there's a there's a new app that we're beta testing through our through Google Plus, who we love, and the question comes from the web. It says, "Did you try to cook?" And this is from oh my god, Melody will post who this is from. By the way, she forgot to post who this was from. It says, "When did um, did you try to cook some uh, Arabic food?" Arabic, Arabic, Arabic food. Arabic. <laughs> oh my god. You have know I what? ever tried to cook Arabic food? It's this. Oh, it's your vodka talking. No, gin, 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 gin. You know, I actually had a gin mojito at the bar. I had it at um, Roosevelt, which I tweeted to you, Renee, and it was $22 for one drink. How did I miss that tweet? Oh, my God. I did. I, oh, maybe it didn't go out. I should look to see if it actually went out. $22. $22. Roosevelt Hotel. The service was great, though, right? Well, you know what I did? Actually, this is a little bit off topic, but I asked the bartender. I'm one of those people who I'm like, he's like, what do you want? And I'm like, what's your signature drink? <laughs> and he's like, he doesn't realize I'm going to like tweet it and post yeah. it and put it everywhere. Yeah. And he's like, he looked at me and he's like, oh, I'll make you something interesting. Mm -hmm. And so he's like, and we're like, a mojito? And he goes, oh, and he started with gin. And I'm like, hmm. And it was a gin mojito and it was delicious, which kind of yeah. made me think like Southern, you know. Yeah. Kind of gin and mint. Well, mint, mint, is, mint is the flavor of a Southern summer. I mean, mint, peaches, butter beans, corn, okra, <laughs> tomatoes. Um, Arabic food, I haven't cooked much Arabic food, but I'd, I'd, I'd love to try. I mean, I, I think there's a lot of, um, if I'm not mistaken, Arabic food is very rice-driven. Like, there's, it's a rice culture, and, and Charleston is a rice culture as well. Um, so, you know, the, there, there are a lot of correspondences. That's the other thing. To me, like, I, you know, I like finding correspondences between cultures, and that's why I think, like, it's, it's exciting to go to a, a town like Atlanta where so much of Atlanta is like new immigrant communities processing southern ingredients and so like sort of figuring out how collard greens are going to fit into their kimchi tradition um, and, and that sort of thing and you find these great places. There's a place called Heirloom Market Barbecue and it's a Korean a Korean woman who was a Korean, she was actually like the Britney Spears of Korea until like eight years ago and then she moved to the United States. She met this guy who's like grew up in the Central Texas barbecue tradition and they're doing this Korean Central Texas mashup in Atlanta and it's like, it's so good. It's so, and, and it's in this funny sort of service station, like adjunct to a service station and 
they, they're literally um, like bursting at the seams, like the parking lot on every day, and it's everyone is there. It's like, um, you know, uh, lawyers from the law office. It's kind of on a ring road, so there are the industrial parks and big office towers. Everyone goes there for lunch because it just tastes so good, and it's synthesizing so many things about Southern food, which are we love our pick one pickles, you know, the sour, spicy pickles. We love smoke, um, you know, we love barbecue. And if you think about it, Korean um, Korean food and mm -hmm. and and Southern food have a lot of you know smoky, sour, salty, sweet kind of that sort of. You know, you had me at sweet. <laughs> like that's it. <laughs> I, have, I told you, I'm like, I'm like into cupcakes. I'm into cheese. The cheesecake thing got <laughs> I me. I, cake, I, I was actually very curious about that. You know, I just want to make sure that the the question that was asked is um, the person's name is Budor Am. So I want to make sure that okay. that person gets their name. Also, I have a couple of more questions. Um, Kim Pebley is from the Florida Panhandle and living in Arizona, and I have not had any boiled peanuts in eight years. Since oh, wow. I'm, since I'm gluten-free, what ingredients are used to make them by the Libros? And you could make my day. That's basically what she's saying. She's saying, okay. what did she do? Boiled peanuts are really easy. All it is is raw peanuts. Um, and I will answer the question, but it requires a little bit of backstory. Um, so peanuts actually grow underground, and they're legumes. They're not nuts. I mean, they're not tree nuts. And you pull them out of the ground, and they're very they're they're legumes like butter beans or you know green beans. They have a very bean-like flavor when they're fresh and green. And when you take them out of the ground when they're green and you boil them that in salt water, lots of salt water. That's boiled peanuts, and that's all they are. I mean, there's there's no gluten in them, as far as I know. Hmm. They're beans. So I think you made her day. Yeah. So I think I just made your day. It's water, salt, and um, it's water, salt, and raw peanuts in the shell. You boil them in the shell, as she knows, because she grew up in the Panhandle, so she knows what they look like. And you boil them basically until they're salty as you want, and this delicious as you want. Um, there, That recipe is also online, I'm sure, but it's also in our new book. Um, the salinity of the water should be sort of like ocean water, and it's basically a, a third of a cup per gallon of kosher salt. Uh, you know, we have a giveaway today. Uh, Ted, why don't you... I'm going to tell people how they're going to win, and then after I do, then tell us what they're going to win. So we'll do it sort of while we're waiting for people to call us in. Um, we have a Skype number that Melody... Now, I, I'm looking at my desk right now, and I do not see my Skype phone number. <laughs> so Melody is going to have to tell us what the number is, or she's going to have to post the number somewhere, because I'm looking for my Post-it, and I do not see it. Oh, there we go. Woo, woo, woo. So 310... 601-4017 if you want to win a copy of this cookbook. The Lee Brothers yes. Charleston Kitchen. Yes. Lee Repeat Brothers that number a few more times. I bet. What would you say, Renee? Repeat that number a few more times. Oh, Melody. you got to <laughs> put it back up. 310-601. So make sure you guys call. And Kitty H just also signed in. Hello, Kitty. Welcome. Um, so Ted, do you want to just tell us about the book so that yeah, um, it's it's the book for those of you who have just tuned in. It's the book that's nearest and dearest to my heart. It's our third book, but it's about the place where I grew up, Charleston, um, and it's sort of um, it, it's about you know everywhere we take inspiration from, both the past and the present. You know, I mentioned it's about home cooking, but um, we also tip our hats to the restaurant chefs who inspire us there on a daily basis. Like our shrimp and grits recipe was completely changed by a restaurant called The Glass Onion, which is right outside of Charleston. They cut the, the shrimp in, in half lengthwise um, so that when it hits the pan, you know, raw, you, you know, you shell it, cut it in half lengthwise, it hits the pan and it curls up and it becomes, it gives more surface area for the sauce to cling to and it's just awesome. Um, so it's a really fun book that sort of draws links between. You just made my between, day. <laughs> uh, um, it draws links between 
Charleston past and Charleston present in a way that I think is fun. And there's there's also there's some fun stuff in there. It, we also wanted we use cookbooks like guidebooks a lot of the times. Like we'll take um, like there's this book, The Foods of Paradise, that you've got to take to Hawaii if you go to Hawaii. It's just gonna like blow your mind how how what a great guide it is to what you're eating while you're there. So we put in in this book we put in a map because we realized that every recipe in the book, Charleston's a small town and pretty much every recipe in the book could be traced to a specific house that you know either we cooked it in or we were inspired by or you know we met someone who you know who cooked it there or that's where the recipe was created and so there's like a sort of walking tour of um, houses that respond that correspond to houses or locations that correspond to recipes in the book and there's also a driving tour for, for locations that are outside town. Because that's another thing cool about Charleston, and people who've been there will know this, is that the country and the city are very in, in very much close proximity, and that's something really exciting. Like, we start the book with a story about how we were doing an oyster roast, and we wanted to serve some collard greens, but the party kind of, the oyster roast, which is sort of an outdoor wood-fired oyster feast, um, that is kind of like, it's the clam bake of Charleston, you know. New Englanders have clam bakes, we have oyster roast. We were doing an oyster roast and the, we'd originally only planned for a party of 12 and it kind of expanded to 60 in, in a short space and so we needed a lot of collard greens. And we went to this farm, you know, because to get lots of collard greens it's like you could go to the supermarket and get, you know, collard greens trucked in from California or you could just go to the farm and get like a big mess of them and that's what we did and you know the farm's only like 10 miles outside of town um, it's just really so close to um, what is really quite an urban cosmopolitan city yeah I just want to remind everyone who is thinking about calling in because they want to win but thinking that the Skype is going to put them on video you will not be on video it will only be audio we talked about this two weeks ago when Kim thought she was going to be in her pajamas on screen. No. And Kim, you can win this time. <laughs> do it, do it, do it, do it. Um, you know, what, what was it like working with your brother, like, on the cookbooks? What's that well, like? Well, you know, Matt and I, it's funny because we, um, we really had nothing to say to each other when we were growing up. I mean, we, 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 Growing up in Charleston, we you know we were very different people. And if you had told me then that I would be working with my brother, um, and now we've had a working relationship since 1993 now, so I mean, 20 years, um, I would have said you were crazy because I was into skateboarding and punk rock, and he was into like classical music and computers, and we shared a room. We actually shared a bedroom growing up, um, and. Uh, you know, so we lived in fairly close proximity, but we fair, we very rarely said any civil words to each other. So it, it's it's it's, but you know, if your subject is food, um, we have all these shared experiences that are largely based on you know growing up in the household we grew up in, having the influences we had um, in a food, you know, from a food perspective. Um, so in a way, it it's not it's not so surprising that we ended up here um, although if yeah if you if you told me I was going to be a cookbook author 20 years ago I probably would have said you were crazy <laughs> well, well what did you want to be when you grew up now I gotta know I wanted to be an ear nose and throat doctor wow, and then, what? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know I was just really interested in that like for you know it's seventh grade biology you see how it all connects and then I Dad, you know, as I said, he's a professor of medicine. I worked in his lab one summer, and all I had to do was take blood from a rabbit, and um, and I fainted, like cold out, totally fainted, um, just sticking a needle into a rabbit's ear. So, you know, he works in a lab, um, and so I, I was like, you know what? Maybe not. Maybe <laughs> maybe not so much a doctor. <laughs> I don't faint at the sight of blood as much anymore. Well, I think Melody said we had a phone call. Hey. Hello, welcome to Kitchen Party. Thank you, and thank you for having Ted Leon. I'm just 
so appreciating his knowledge and his passion for Southern cuisine. Awesome. Do you want Thank to tell you. us who, who you are and where you're calling from? Yes. Uh, my name is Kim Watkinson. I'm the Ninja Baker, and I'd love to win the cookbook. <laughs> yeah, you won. You won. <laughs> but, but you're it, you're Ninja Baker. Here. Do you have any questions for Ted, too, You know, while, while we're taking the opportunity? Um, no, I think I, I'm, I'm, I've asked a lot of questions already, and I thank you so much for um, introducing me also to the Southern Foodways Alliance. And I'm oh. by the summit in October too. Uh, will you be there? <laughs> um, you know what? It is the hardest. It's uh, it's probably already sold out. It really is the hardest ticket to get um, in the food world, and because they keep it small, it's only like 275 people, so that everyone can really have an interaction. Um, but if you don't get into if you don't get in on the registration, I didn't get in this year. Um, and the theme this year is women in food, which I'm Dying to, I'm, I'm dying to go to that symposium. Renee, I think, I think we can go. Like, uh, <laughs> we can go. No, I, you know, you, they, um, but for whatever reason, I didn't win the lottery, so, um, so I won't be going this year. But I really, I, I'm hoping I'm on the wait list at least. Um, but it's a really, it's a really special thing, and and they have events throughout the nation throughout the year. You just need to stay on their event schedule and find out what's going on. The the symposium is not the only thing. They they do a lot of um, screenings of films, new documentaries. They do um, oral histories. There's so much, so many resources to draw from from that organization. Great. I'll I'll get on there. I just noticed no real accent. Yeah, that's 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 yeah, that's that's the whole thing about being born in New York and growing up in Charleston is that I kind of you know, when I go back to Charleston and I've had a few drinks, <laughs> there it is a little bit. <laughs> and, and it's it's interesting. I mean, the other thing is that um, you know, my parents are not native southerners and I think that has a real impression. Another thing is that I've um, I went to college in the Northeast, and I think there was a lot of pressure on fitting in and sort of, you know, I don't know. I was an impressionable teenager back then, so what did I know? But I I wanted to fit in with college kids, and they you know, they all talked like they were from boarding school. I don't know what that sounded like, but it was different from the way I talked. Um, but uh, my southern accent will come out pretty hard um, in the right circumstances. <laughs> okay, Babette, so we got to go to Charleston, show up at his doorstep, and then get him to drink. Absolutely. <laughs> I want to make sure Kim knows that we thank her for calling in, and I'm going to reach back out to you on Google Plus and get your address of where we can send. I'll make sure that Ted gets your address so that he can send you yeah. the, um, the price. I'll send and also Oh, and also Kim Pembley too. Your your cookbook is on its way too from the last win. I'll make sure you get that as well. What were you gonna say, Ted? Thank you. What was I gonna say? I can't remember. You were gonna it's say, the, come on over for bourbon. dinner. I was gonna say, come on over for dinner. Oh no, I was also gonna say that um, you know, it's it's funny because I I kind of split my time between New York, where my my wife's an artist in Brooklyn. And Charleston, and my brother lives in Charleston full time with his family, um, and so you know I shuttle back and forth, and it, it really kind of it's so funny because some people in New York think I have such a southern accent, and I'm just like, really interesting. <laughs> that's cool. Um, but there are also the other thing that's interesting about Charleston. If you if you go to Charleston, really. Um, Tune in to like the different accents you hear in Charleston because it's it's you know there there are amazing different accents that um, some sort of recall almost like Scottish accents um, and then the um, on the Sea Islands there's a there's it's its own you know accent that is so beautiful and I just you know I I could listen to it forever but you really know an old Charlestonian when you hear that. That accent coming through. Um, well, I got to ask a, you, what does that sound like? Can, can you? <laughs> you know what? Um, I'll send you the link to a Piggly Wiggly commercial um, <laughs> that that my friend um, did the voiceover for, 
and she she grew up in downtown Charleston, but it's a very lilting and and um, musical accent. Um, it's if you if you Google um, Piggly Wiggly, which is a supermarket, and um, local since forever, Look. you'll find like the YouTube commercial. The the um, the the person I'm talking about is a writer who's a friend of mine named Josephine Humphreys. She's a novelist, um, but she also is um, a historian of of the Low Country, and she just has such a beautiful voice. Um, and uh, it, it's a very Charleston accent. What can I say? Ted, um, I can listen to you all night long. I can. I feel well, like we're you know. I mean, I almost forgot we're doing a show. <laughs> Like, like, oh, I'm thinking about the food. I'm thinking about the people. We're going to have to definitely make a road trip out there. Renee, is there anything you'd like to add? Um, also, Jeff uh, Jeff popped in for a second on Twitter. Hello, Jeff. We miss you. Um, do, is there anything you'd like to add before we, we round it out? And then also I want to make sure, Ted, you tell us where we can find you and where people can go buy the book. Oh, yeah. That. What's coming up new? What's what's you happening? Can, you what can, you, look out you for? can buy the book on our website, um, which is Boiled Peanuts. Dot com. It's all one word, plural, um, or mattleeandtedlee.com, and um, where you can buy the book. Yeah, that's where you can buy signed copies of the book. Um, definitely come to Charleston. Follow us on Twitter at the Lee Bros, T H E L E E B R O S, um, and um, friend us on Facebook and. You'll you'll probably find out more than you ever wanted to know about these two <laughs> brothers from Charleston. <laughs> Anything, Renee? You'd like to uh, add? Yeah, I I would like to. I I um uh, I love the cookbooks. Um, in part, thank you because of what you said earlier about the celebration of vegetables. I mean, I think it's kind of the easy way out to want to just deep fry everything or play into mm -hmm. that kind of stereotypical mm -hmm. Southern fare, just... and uh, you guys have just so decidedly not have gone that route and I, I just really appreciate the way you celebrate the diversity because I think the South is is really one of the most diverse areas mm -hmm. uh, of the country. It's just amazing yeah. and, uh, and I appreciate how you highlight all of that. Well thank you. Thank you. It's been so enjoyable. I'd love to do it again. Great. Well, uh, if we invite you back on the show will you come back Ted? Yes. And is this yes. your first group? But Matt's going to be jealous. Is it? Yes, but we'll get you guys both to... But wait, Actually, you, you have to make him promise he's going to bring a mason jar. Yes, That's I'll make him true. promise. You know, I, I think I'm getting a little intoxicated because I'm talking and I'm actually like stumbling over myself. <laughs> I'm like, la, 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 la. Anyway, um, we, we definitely want you back. We definitely want to know about all your cookbooks that are coming out and any news that you have. Please reach out to us and say, I want to be on Kitchen Party. I want to tell the world about, um, about what, what we're doing. Cause we, I promise you I'll do that. Now you're like our friends. Now you, you know. We'd like to like, share that. Share I love the kitchen news. party. Yay! I love the kitchen party. <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks everyone for watching on Twitter, on YouTube, on Facebook, mm -hmm. on Google Plus. Uh, if you guys have any questions, please follow us on Google, Bakespace.com. You can follow us on Twitter, Bakespace, on Facebook, Bakespace. I mean, it's this is ridiculous. It's Pinterest, everywhere. Bakespace, just Bakespace. You'll you'll <laughs> find us. Um, Renee, you know, you did not get to introduce yourself when you popped in. Do you want to do a real quick like who you are? Sure, just Renee Lynch with the LA Times. <laughs> and where can people find you? Uh, Renee Lynch on Twitter, Pinterest, Google Plus, all the all the platforms. Instagram. Awesome. All right, guys. We will see you later. Thanks, Ted, for joining us. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much. Bye. Good night. <laughs> Music. I'm not hearing any music. You're not? No. I, you know what? I couldn't hear the caller either. Really? Nope. I can hear it. Just yeah. pretend that you're shaking. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be funny if we're going the opposite direction. I'm so, I'm so sad that Jeff didn't make it because he was so looking forward to the interview with Ted. I, I, we'll have to get him next time. We'll have yeah. to get him next time.